<laughs> Amen. That was good. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Get this thing connected here. Already ready, already. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Good to see all you guys. I'm excited to be here this morning. And, uh, and uh, I got this message I've been working on. And it's called, Is It a Stepping Stone or Stumbling Block? So if you will turn to... I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, no, turn to Second Kings this morning. Second Kings is where we're going to look at. And, uh, you know, it's funny, I was praying about what God would have me preach, and I was looking over, I have a couple, um, we're, we're, you know, as, as preachers, we're always looking and making uh, different uh, messages and things like that, finding things, and I remember one day I was driving through town, and I wrote a whole message for my youth group um, uh, about uh, street signs, it was all, all the street signs I saw, and I made a whole, I was just driving through town, I just, verses come into your head, and I started putting all this stuff together, and, and uh, it was pretty crazy that I ended up because when you, know, you talk about, you drive through uh, town, you'll see signs like stop and yield and, uh, you know, right turn only, you know, put a whole message together about that, about uh, teenagers making right decisions and things like that. And uh, so it was a blessing, but uh, I was praying about what God would have me preach here. And this is a message I preached before. I don't think I preached it here, but it's one, it's an, it's an older one, but, um, and I was one, I was like, okay, Lord, this is the one you want me to preach. I'm not sure why. And I got here, and, and last night, Angel came up to me. He says, what are you preaching tomorrow, Brother Ed? And uh, don't you hate when you get that question? You're like, oh, man, uh, I'm not sure. But I told him, I said, you know, I think I'm going to preach on vessels. And Angel goes, oh, well, that's our theme this year. And I was like, oh, I, I, don't, I forgot all about that. I remember seeing that before, that the theme was vessels. And so you probably heard this message. You might have even had preached out of this because that's your theme this year. But that's okay. You're going to hear it again. So amen. amen. Just keep on preaching. So um, so Second Kings, uh, it's a place here where uh, we're talking about um, uh, Elisha. Amen. Elisha. And uh you know, Elisha was the one that took the mantle from Elijah. Elijah was a prophet before. Elisha came along after him. And, and uh, they were both preachers. They were both prophets of God, but they, they were different people, uh, completely different ways of ministry. And we're actually going to talk a little bit about that. But um, because uh, it's clear that uh, Elisha really and Elijah, you know, the way that uh, Elijah preached. And, and if you ever studied these guys out, Elijah was uh, the prophet of the desert. He was the one that uh, he, he would, <laughs> there'd be a crisis in the land and Elijah would come out of the desert, just appear. <laughs> He'd show up and uh, appear from the lonely wilderness. And uh, when there was some kind of uh, religious or political crisis, whatever was going on, and then uh, he would preach and he would, he would give the word of God. And then when the problems were resolved, then Elijah would dramatically disappear again. <laughs> he would just be like, okay, my job's done. And he'd leave and, and uh, go back to some remote dwelling place somewhere, and um, Elisha uh, uh, was, yeah, was different than he was, because as he came along, he was a little more, and I, 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 this is a cool word, he was more gregarious, how's that, how's that for a big word, amen, Greg, I don't even know what that means, but it, that's, it's a good one, anyway, but he was spending, you know, Elisha spent his time uh, uh, surrounded more around the people, Elisha was more uh, around the people first, because for him, uh, you know, he was a uh, uh, he was always interested in what was going on. He was trying to uh, more of a human, more interested in what's going on and human interest, things like that. And so um, he was at home. Uh, Elisha was with the daily experiences of the common folks that were going on. He didn't disappear into the wilderness or anything. And his miracles, um, I, w I don't want to say they were less spectacular than Elijah's, but uh, they were, you know, because miracles are miracles, they're amazing. But uh, they were maybe more humane, I guess, more characterized by Elisha because that's the way he was. They're kind of it, it small in kindnesses. And that's one where they're going to read here and the courtesies that he did and the individual considerations of, of ordinary persons. That's what Elijah was. Uh, uh, you know, um, Elisha was, I'm sorry. Elijah would call down fire from heaven and, and, you know, just amazing things like that. And then Elisha, he's just in this widow's house that we're going to talk about. Is very more personal. And so uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, in verse number 1, 
Let's read there in first, uh, and for, through uh, verse 7. The Bible says, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the, the creditor is come to take him, uh, my two sons, to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid had nothing, not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. And verse 3, he's, Then he said, Go. Borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and pour out in, unto all, into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. I thought that was pretty um, fortuitous this morning as I was sitting here on the front row, and, and Pastor mentions Alden and says, we need to pour into him. And I was like, that's in my message. I love how God does that stuff. We're talking about that this morning, Brother AC. God put things together, uh, and nobody talked about it or anything. It just works that way. Uh, so there he says, take that, and, and uh, when thou art come in, verse number four, pour into all those vessels, thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, and who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There's not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. And they came, and uh, uh, she came and told the man of God. She came back to Elisha, and, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. Wow. That's pretty awesome. Amen. Pretty awesome what he did there just for this one lady. And uh, uh, he was more... Uh, about uh, helping the individual, Elisha was, and uh, he's kind of, you know, and these guys are all, there are pictures of the Lord Jesus, because Jesus Christ was, he was personal too, and he would, he would talk to people, he healed the blind man, he healed, you know, he, he walked up to you, he called you by name, yeah. amen. Uh, I think about the, in, in the Bible where Jesus is walking along, and, and, um, uh, and, and, uh, uh, Bartimaeus is the one we're talking about, right? Bartimaeus comes to... Now, here's the thing. Did you know that that's not his name? It's not his name. Everybody calls him Bartimaeus. Right. They call him blind Bartimaeus. But if you know anything about the Bible, uh, when they say bar anything, that's, it, bar means son of, right? Amen? So if I were to say this is Andy, I would say bar Andy or, or bar AJ. Amen? Because you are the son of AJ. Right. My dad's name uh, was Ed as well. I'm Ed Jr., but I would be Bar Edward right? <laughs> because I'm Bar. So if you know that scripture, when Jesus is going along there and, and Bar, uh, the, the blind man comes to him, they say, isn't this Bar Timaeus, the son of Timaeus? He's their son. We don't ever know. his. We still don't know his name. We'll never know. We'll never know who that guy is. But Jesus knew. Yeah. Jesus knew what his name was. There's a lot of people that go through life that think God doesn't know who you are. Are you, are you think that nobody knows who you are? I'm a nobody. Nobody cares who I am. God knows. God knew who you were. Craig, God knew who you were. Amen. Amen. He found you and, and, he, and pointed you and AJ, your direction one day. Yeah. Amen. Every single person in here, God knows who you are. Amen. It's very personal. And Elisha was here with this widow woman, and he does this miracle for this miracle. It's amazing, and I, lo I love it. It's so cool. Uh, we consider ourselves less, uh, all of us will consider ourselves less than extraordinary, and we're, you know, we're not, uh, not, not uh, that, I mean, some of us are, are, are pretty amazing. I mean, I'm, you know, there's only a few of us around, but, um, but no, I'm just kidding. But, um, <laughs> uh, but listen to this. I mean, you, you can, we're not, you know, we're just, we're nobodies. I'm a nobody. We've, you've had some amazing preachers stand behind this holy desk and preach. I've watched it online, and I've seen some of the men that have come up here, and I am nowhere near that category of that kind of person, but I love the fact that God has used me to, as Pastor uh, 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 AJ said, to be uh, uh, serving him for all these years and just continue to do so. I don't have any plans to change or do anything else. I don't even know what else I'd be doing if I wasn't doing this. I really have no clue what else I'd be doing. Amen. I remember when I was young, I wanted to be an architect. I thought it would be cool to build buildings and stuff. And then I found out that it involves math. And I was like, nope, never mind. And I ain't doing that. Amen. 
and that's not going to be a thing in my life. Amen. Of course, when I was really, really young, uh, I, I was, uh, I remember I came to my, my parents and I wanted to be a fire truck. I wasn't a smart kid, okay? I wasn't very smart. I didn't know what I was doing. My parents were like, you can't be a fire truck. And I got older. I think I was a little younger than, than, uh, than maybe uh, Angel here. And uh, I remember going to my parents and saying, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. I wanted to, I wanted to fly planes. And my, my dad was like, oh, great. Who are you going to fly for? And I said, the Salvation Army. And he said, okay. I wasn't a smart kid, I'm telling you. I did not know, you know. And uh, I don't know, maybe, you could, maybe I could be a bomber pilot of the Salvation Army or just fly in and just drop boxes of clothes on people. I don't know. I could have done something like that. I did not know what I wanted to do. So growing up, I had no idea. But when I found the Lord, yeah. uh, the, all the jumbled things in my head came into, came into a direction. And it's amazing what God will do that, that, that God does that for every person. And so, you know, I, most of us can never confront kings or presidents or heads of states. We can't threaten governments or influence international developments. You know, that's what Elijah did. Elijah did that. He was the one that, that stood up against the, the political leaders of his day and things like that. And, and, but we can, however, we can, however, imitate the caring and personal style of Elisha. And in doing that, we can be more like Jesus, too. Isn't it true that those who concentrate on the everyday needs of people, listen to this, often do more good in the world than those who only aim at spectacular accomplishments? History is more often moved forward by peripheral figures than the headline makers. That's what happens. Robert Browning once said, have you... Ha, uh, uh, would you have your songs endure? He says, build on the human heart. You want something to endure? Build on something that's going to affect people or touch people. We need to have such an emphasis, emphasis today on the personal. When we live, uh, when people, uh, here's the thing. I like what Pastor said a minute ago. I, I am thankful for the big churches as well. Amen. Amen. Southwest Baptist Church in, uh, in Oklahoma City, Brother, Brother Jason Gaddis over there, Brother Paul Chapel at Lancaster. Great, big, huge independent Baptist churches. I love visiting those churches and seeing them, but I love the churches that I get to go to like this. I go to the churches out on the reservation in New Mexico and Arizona, and I preach for them, and I sing for them, and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, do what I can to help them. I, uh, I'm going to help. Uh, I, uh, just earlier this year in August, I was in Wisconsin at a, at a church, Victory Baptist Church in Thorpe, Wisconsin. Thorpe, Wisconsin, if you look it up, is exactly one mile square. That's the entire city. That's the entire city of Thorpe, Wisconsin. That's where he's ministering, my best friend Jay Pritchard. We grew, up, we grew up together in our church in Aztec. He's ministering there. He asked me to come up every year. I come here, and I go there every year. Those are the two places I go to every year. that I don't, They're on my calendar every year, and I love it. But going up there, you know, he's in this tiny little town, and, and uh, it's just surrounded by dairy farmers and, and all this. Kind of, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's very green and beautiful up there. And uh, I, I enjoy going up there. And, and uh, you know, it's these little churches, though, that uh, I love going to and I love helping them. And I'll tell you something. I think it was Brother um, R.B. Willette was at our church one time. And he said, if every church in America, if all of the, the biggest donors in those church just stop giving, if all the biggest donors, people that give the most in every church, if they just stopped giving, the church would continue. But he said, if those that just give what they can and do what they do, uh, give of their, of, their, what, of their substance each week, he said, if those people quit, the church would stop overnight. Because it's not about the big accomplishments. It's about being consistent and faithful and just following the Lord. Amen. Elijah was about, he did some major, amazing, big things like that. Elisha was different. He was the one that did something different. Now, think about this. Uh, we need to live, we need to have such an emphasis on the personal today that when, when, listen, when people live in crowded together, mass population centers, this is where you live. Amen? That's where you guys are. Where's my water? Right here in the LA area. Bellflower and all these places. It's a mass population area. <clears throat> and all these people, let me say this. <clears throat> when people are in places like this, it's easy to lose your individual worth. And becoming, 
people think they become little more than numbers on somebody's record somewhere. And, and uh, <coughs> automation in the, pre, in, the, in the recent years has intensified that process of depersonalization, you know. Uh, we go, uh, they just built a, a, uh, a new uh, uh, gas station in Aztec, New Mexico, a Maverick station. And we're all excited about the new Maverick station, right? I've never seen this before, and you probably have it. You probably had it out here, but we're in New Mexico. We don't have it. Uh, we, stuff gets to us in New Mexico five years after it gets to everywhere else. <laughs> but they built this new Maverick station, and I went in there the first day to check it out, look at it. It was so cool, and uh, they had a self-checkout at a gas station. I'd never seen that. You guys have probably seen it before. I'd never seen that. I was like, self-checkout at a gas station? I don't have to talk to the people at the gas station at all. Just go in there, get your snacks, amen, get your whatever it is. I get my, my white cheddar popcorn. That's my crack. I got to get that. I got to have it. And uh, I get that, get myself a, a Dr. Pepper or something like that, and I go straight to the self-check. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't look at anybody. Boop, 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 boop. Do it, sweep it. I'm out of there, right? It seems like it's more convenient, but really it's deep personalization of our society. More and more people, people don't talk to each other. There's no face-to-face. -face. There's no uh, interpersonal communications that are going on. Automatic teller machines, they dispense money, the ATMs that we have. Um, um, we have uh, cars now that tell us everything that we need to know. It used to be the car would just tell you to put your seatbelt on. Now it tells you all kinds of stuff. Amen? It'll tell you everything you need to know. All these new cars that are coming out and all these voice reminders and everything. And, and you can tell your car to, like, you know, uh, set a meeting for you in a couple hours or whatever. You can do everything. And um, we can use our, our phone uh, to do so many things, uh, receive medical diagnoses even. Uh, we can make uh, airline reservations. We can do, I made a, on my way here, I, I was on the road and I booked a hotel on my phone. I'm, I was already on the way, amen, uh, and make my way here. Um, we can uh, we buy stock shares. We can receive letters without ever seeing or hearing a real live person. The result is absolute loss of personal worth. That's what happens in our society. You know what's funny is that you guys go to those. Uh, you know, speaking of gas stations, you ever go to a gas station and you have those little uh, those little jars next to the ga uh, next to the counter. And they're always for some, some, some of them are for, for major causes. Some of them are just for local things, right? Uh, there was one girl in, uh, a few years ago in uh, Farmington, New Mexico, uh, that she, her family had put these little jars next to all the, the convenience stores in the area uh, because they were trying to raise money for her health. She was having, uh, she was going through chemo and they needed help with her. And they had a little picture of her on the front and they had all this kind of stuff on there. And they said, she's fighting for her life and she's got some kind of cancer. And so people would put money in there, amen? People get, and, and uh, I heard about this, service station down in Houston where this guy that was working there, he, uh, uh, this is an evidence of the disappearance of personal dimension. L listen to this. He put a plastic container beside the cash register. He worked at this gas station. He put a little plastic container beside the cash register, like the ones you see everywhere. And, and uh, those ones are all to collect money for good causes. But what he did was that he put on a plastic container a label that said, help me be free from financial worry. That's all he said. Help me be free from financial worry. And you know what? People were so programmed that people just, you know, just dropping their change in there, dropping their money in there, all that stuff. And they can, they, people come conditioned to drop their change in that container and uh, to whatever it is, Red Cross, muscular dystrophy, whatever it is. But nobody ever reads it. I had a friend in high school. His name was Pat Dean. Pat Dean was a rocker. He loved to rock out. And it was a conference. There was a concert that was coming up. I was going to be in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He wanted to go to that concert. He got some little jars and put them in the gas, in the 7-Eleven gas station of our, and, uh, and the uh, Conoco stations of our, of our town and just said, help Pat get to whatever concert it was. And he made money. People put money in those things to help him get to that place. It, it cracked me up that he actually, I was like, I can't, I can't believe you pulled that off. It was crazy. Because people, may, and I'll, I'll bet you half the people that put money in those things didn't even realize it. They didn't even look to read what it was. They are just dropping money in there. We're just, that's the way we are. And so um, they never took time to read the label. And, and uh, it's because we become depersonalized. Elisha talked to people. He talked to this lady. This widow woman knew that she could come right to Elisha and talk to him. And when she looked at him, she said, Elisha, I have a problem. She said, my husband, thy servant of the Lord, has died. 
And now I, there's debt that he owed and our family owed, and, and uh, the creditor has come. The, credit, he, the creditor, the Bible says right there, she said in verse number one, the creditor has come to take my two sons to be bondmen. He's going to take my two sons away to work for him, to work off all the debt that, that we owe him. She said, I don't want to lose my sons to, to be slaves to this guy because we don't know if we'll ever get them back. He might work them until they die. You never know. So she comes to Elisha distraught, and she says, I need, I need, I need help. And Elisha says, okay. He says, well, let me ask you this. What do you have? And she goes, look at verse number two. I don't have anything. She says, and thy handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. And then in verse number three, he says this. Go. Period. Just stop right there. Go. You got to do something. You got to go. You got to do, you got to just sit around. Amen. Listen, this is the problem with our churches across the nation today is we have too many people that come and don't do anything else and they don't go. Okay. They're just sitting on their, on their laurels. They're sitting on their, uh, on the pew. They're just pew sitters each week, not going and doing anything to help the cause of Christ. He said, go. Now he's, he's telling this This is an action. I need you to get up. Uh, the uh, Miss Widow woman and your two sons, you guys need to get up and do something. And this is how you're going to help yourself. He said, go and borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. He says, go out, go out to all your neighbors next door, across the street, down the street, across town. Go to everybody that you know. Go to every door that you know. Knock on their door and ask them, do they have any empty vessels that you can have? Any vessels that you can have? And he says in the end of that verse, borrow not a few. Which means I want you to get as many as you possibly can. I want your boys to be coming home with all kinds of vessels, all right? Hanging off of their, their belt and holding on to them, maybe on some one on their head. They're just trying to get as many as they can back to the house. Bring those vessels back into the house. And then he says, once you've done that, in verse number four, and when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and thy sons. Now, I want you to understand why he said shut the door. This was not for everybody to see. This was for her and her sons. It's personal. Yeah, I like it. It's a personal thing. Shut the door. Just I want you to, you and your sons to see what God's going to do in your life. Shut the door upon you and take those vessels. And he says there, pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt see uh, and set aside that which is full. So take your pot of oil, that one pot of oil you have in your house and put, fill up a vessel and then set it aside. And then take another one, set it aside. And he said, and when you've done that, he said, keep doing that. <laughs> Just keep, keep doing that. And he, look what he said there. Uh, verse number, uh, so she, uh, this is what she did in verse number five. She did what he, she told. She went from him and shut the door upon her and her sons who brought the vessels to her. And she poured out. She poured out. Now, I know that you've probably, uh, this is a verse from, uh, from uh, 2 Timothy. Amen. We know that. The, uh, the, the, some are great, but they are great in the house. There are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also wood and of earth, and some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. St. Corinthians uh, 4 7 says this, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That was a, that was a camp theme one year we made that a camp theme i remember several years ago i don't know if you were you probably remember i don't know if the boys will because they're well the boys wouldn't remember anything so anyway but uh, <laughs> we are troubled on every side the bible says there yet not distressed we are perplexed but not in despair persecuted but not forsaken cast down but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the lord jesus that the life also of jesus might be made manifest in our body we are the vessels, amen? So if you take that and understand we are the earthen vessels and take that, understand what we just read in this passage of scripture today, he says, ma'am, I need you to go and borrow empty vessels. So I got some vessels here this morning. This one, very bland and boring. Let's call that AC. And uh, I'm just kidding, just kidding. We got vessels here. Here's another vessel. I like this one because it's green. Green's my favorite color. All right. And then here's, here's the one. This is pink. This is Andy right here. Okay. So, so we, got, uh, we got this tall one here. This is a really cool one. I like that one there. All these vessels. Even got this cool, whimsical one. How cool is that? It's got a little straw on the side. 
all different. Different sizes, different shapes, different colors. Just like where we live. Everybody around you, everybody in this room, different sizes, different shapes, different colors. Do you guys know something? She says, the only thing I have in my house is a pot of oil. Did you know that oil in the Bible is often referenced as being a picture of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the oil. God desires to pour out his spirit and his blessings into vessels so they can be vessels unto honor, so that God can use them. The oil is there. By the way, people talk about, preacher, you talk about people that have, we've known over the years that have fallen out of, uh, of uh, the ministry and not longer there. They got mad at God or they, they got crossways with something or something happened. And you know what? Uh, the, this, I learned this years ago from, as a brother Willette again. He, he wrote a book about it. But he said this, listen, you know, people just, they, 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 get, they start to get uh, 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 crossways with something or there's friction with, between them and somebody. And listen, if you're driving a car without any oil in it, guess what's going to happen? It's going to build up friction and it's going to lock up and it's going to stop. And it won't be any good which is exactly what many people has happened in their own lives. Because they're trying to go through life without the Holy Spirit, without that oil, without that oil to keep them going and keep things uh, working and, and keep things going the right way. And uh, you know what? When you don't have that oil in your life and you're not tuned in, last time I was here, last year, I think we talked about the Holy Spirit. And uh, I'll tell you something, you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life, you're going to lock up. And people are going to, you're going to fall out of church. You're going to fall away from God. God is wanting and waiting and, and desiring to pour out his spirit into you. Yeah. He wants it. It's there. He says, I need you to, I want to serve you. I want you to serve me and I want you to do something. And, and he's, he's looking for people that will say, I want to be a vessel of honor that God can use. doesn't matter who you are, how old you are, how small you are, what color you are, what shape you are. God can use you today. When, he told, when this widow woman came and told Elisha, she said, I, I, I did what you told me to do. She, in verse number six, she said, it came to pass when the vessels were full. Listen, what she had done is she said she got in there. She took that one pot of oil that she had. And she started pouring out. And she says, I need to pour out some stuff. And so she goes... Here, bring me, bring me a vessel. Say, okay, here you go, mom. She pours it out. Okay, so that one's full. Let's set that aside. Okay, let's get another one. Okay, here you go, mom. Okay, I'm going to pour this in. Okay, that one's filling up. All right, let's set that aside. Okay, bring me another one. Okay, here you go, mom. Here you go, there's another one. And so she keeps doing this and keeps going along as they're filling up. And she keeps setting, the, and just what Elisha said, he said, when they're full, set them aside. So she kept doing that. And she was going all the way through. And she kept doing that filling them up. And you know what was amazing to her? As like I said, they had shut the door behind them. Nobody was seeing this miracle except her. It's a very personal thing between her and God. Was God was showing her something. And so she, it was just something that she needed to see in her own life. And I'll bet as she did that, she kept going, this, there's still oil. There's, there's, bring me another one. The oil was just, it stayed. It kept going. I mean, the oil was still there. And so she kept filling up and kept filling up. And he said to borrow as many vessels as you possibly could. And so they filled up every vessel that they could in the house. And they were going. And it was so amazing that she just kept going. And look what she says. Wait, wait. She says, I, I filled them all up. She goes, hold on, hold on. Let me get some more in this one. I think I can fit some more in here. And she goes, oh, wait. I got some. Bring me. She says, okay, this one's full. She goes, bring me another vessel. And what was her answer? The, the answer came to her in verse number six. When she said, bring me yet a vessel, he said unto her, there is not a vessel more. <laughs> We're out, mom. That's all the vessels we could gather, man. Me and my brother, those are all, we could try to go get some others, but we borrowed every neighbor's empty vessel that they had. And that, we just filled them all up, mom. They're all over the house. We've got to step over them. I'm trying to knock, knock them over. I don't know what you want to do. And she goes, bring me another vessel. They're like, We're done. We're out. What a blessing. That that happened for them. So she goes and she tells Elisha, Elisha, I did what you told me to do. And I got this house full of vessels of oil everywhere. And Elisha says, well, take those pots, take those vessels, go and sell them. 
Go to the market, sell them, make all that money, and go pay off your debt. debt. And the Bible says, take what you, was left and live off the rest. They made so much money that they not only paid their debt off, they were able to live on what God had provided for them. Yeah. That was amazing, yeah. amen? And God was, was showing them something. Elisha was personally showing them, he, uh, telling her this is what God wants to do in your life for you and your sons to see exactly what God can do with one person who is obedient and wants to follow God. That's good. It's amazing. But when we think about it as we are the earthen vessels and God has his Holy Spirit wanting to pour us out, amen? Praise the Lord. He wants to fill one up. And he says, I'm going to fill this one up. And I'm going to send this one out to do foreign mission field. Amen. You're going to, to uh, South Korea. You're going to preach over there. You're going to the Philippines. You're going to preach over there. You, you're going to, somewhere, you're going to start churches across the United States. Filling you up. And you're going over there. He has somebody else who comes along. He says, you're going to be a youth pastor. You're going to pastor a, 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 a church somewhere. You're going to and then, or, uh, be a youth pastor and, and, and lead a youth group. You are going to be a pastor. You're going to go pastor a church that needs a pastor that will take over. You are going to start churches. You're going across the United And God is filling you up and sending you out. And he takes another one. And he fills and pours his spirit into this vessel. And he sends them out. He says, you're, just, you're going to be a faithful soul winner in a church. You're going to be a, a help to every church that you go to. God is, is looking for all these vessels. I'm going to fill you up with my spirit. And I'm going to send you out to do something for me. Praise God. Amen. God's waiting for that. He's got his oil ready. And he's like, I am ready to pour my spirit and my blessings into every single earthen vessel that will, that will open their heart to me and say, I want you, God, to do whatever you want with my life. He's waiting for that. And guess what? God is saying, all right, I, there's one to the foreign field. There's one to be a missionary. There's one to start churches. There's one to be a youth pastor. Amen. Bring me out a vessel. There's not a vessel more. What? People stop surrendering. People stop coming to church. People stop serving. People gave up on God. People got mad at God. God is excited to send out vessels to do his work across the entire land. And he says, bring me out a vessel. And you know what the answer he gets? There's not a vessel more. We don't have anybody that wants to surrender their life. We don't have anybody that wants to do anything for you, God. And God says, well, there's youth camps and there's conferences and there's missions conferences. Why aren't people on the altar surrendering their life to me so I can pour out my blessings and my spirit to them? I don't know, God. Just people aren't opening their heart to you anymore. They're not saying, God, I'm going to humble myself for you, and I want to be a vessel unto honor. God, will you use me? Where are the people that would come to an altar and surrender their life to say, God, I want to be used? Whatever it is, you want me to start churches? You want me to be a soul winner? You want me to be a youth pastor? Whatever it is you want me to do, God, I want to do it. Lord, fill me with your blessings. Pour out your spirit in my heart. And God is willing and waiting to do that. But when he turns and says, bring me yet a vessel and the answer is there's no more. And the last part of that verse, in verse number six, is the saddest one. And the oil stayed. God's got his spirit really uh, willing and ready. It stayed because nobody wants to surrender their life to God anymore. They're fighting when God is tugging on your heart to do something. Doesn't matter your age. Doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, how you were brought up. God is tugging on your heart to do something for him, to surrender to him, whatever it is. He's waiting to pour his spirit out into you. And we fight it. And God says, bring me out a vessel. There's not a vessel more. We're out. Where are the people that would surrender their whole life to God? Say, God, I know you've been tugging at my heart to do something more for my church. There's a lady back home in my church that's one of the most faithful ladies I've known. Her name is Miss Loretta. Nobody knows really her name. She's a little Navajo lady that comes to our church. She's got three kids that are all wayward kids. 
She prays for them all the time. They are such a burden on her heart. But she's faithful to come to church. And she's faithful that she shows up every single week. She lives right near the church. She comes over every week and cleans the entire church by herself. And we have a big, long building. She comes and she vacuums between all those pews. She cleans everything up. She wipes the pews down. She dusts the windows. She, does every, she cleans the bathroom. She mops. She does all that, all on her own, just to be faithful, to be a servant of the Lord. And I, and I appreciate that, and I'm appreciative of it. And I tell her that. I tell her how much I appreciate what she's done for the church. She doesn't have a lot, and she doesn't have a, a big income, and she's older. I think she's by maybe... Um, 60s but she has just said God whatever, you, whatever I can do yeah, I like whatever I can do God and God pours his spirit into her and he helps her to go forward clean the church lead the singing run a summer Bible camp there's all kinds of places you can serve the Lord and God is waiting for people so he can fill them up and send them out and he says where's all the vessels Where's all the vessels I can use? He's waiting for you today. Let me ask you today. Would you, is there something in your heart? Let me say this. Is there something in you that you know you haven't given up to God and it's keeping you from being fully in to serve the Lord? And maybe it is that you just haven't really thought about it. Maybe you just, wow, I never really thought I could just surrender whatever it is. When I surrendered to to uh, full-time service to the Lord, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I didn't know if I wanted to be in youth. I didn't want to be a missionary, pastor. I didn't know what I wanted to do. But I knew that I wanted to serve God. So I came to an altar. This was at Silver State Baptist Youth Camp in Colorado. That whole week, I was getting beat up by the preaching that week. And as a teenager, I was 17 years old. And I came to the altar on that side of the building and I knelt down and I said, God, I'm just 17 years old. I don't know what I can do, but I'm going to surrender my life, God, to whatever you want me to do, whatever it is, God. You have my heart and you have my life. At the same time, on this end of that same service, on this end of the altar, a teenager, a year older than me, came down and knelt down and says, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to surrender my life. And that is my friend Jay Pritchard, who now preaches in Wisconsin, in Thorpe, Wisconsin. We're both still in the ministry. He was one of the first independent Baptists. He was the first independent Baptist to go into Madagascar and start a church in Madagascar. On the other side of the world, the island nation of Madagascar, he started a church, he started a Christian school, he started a Bible college. It's still going today. God used him to go to the other side of the world with his family, flying with six kids internationally through London and Lisbon and England. And man, that was crazy. You guys drive across the country with your kids. Imagine getting all on an airplane and flying across the Pacific Ocean. Crazy. He did that because that's what God wanted him to do. And he surrendered his life on that end of the altar at that very safe camp that I surrendered my life on that side. And I remember on the way home, we're driving in the, on, the, on the church bus on the way back to, to our church. We're sitting in the back, and I, he said, did you make any decision? I said, yeah. I said, I surrender my life to whatever God wants me to do. He said, me too. He said, when did you do it? I said, last night at the service. He said, me too. I was like, really? Yeah. And we've been best friends ever since. Yeah. Still serving. Yeah. Because all we did was say, God, yeah. I'm nobody. I'm misshapen. I'm a weird color. I'm a weird guy. I'm a complete goofball. But God, if you can use me, yeah. fill me with your spirit. Yeah. Let me be used. Every head bowed and every eye closed today. Good. God is waiting. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Are you letting God use your life? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to get into you? Or is that oil stayed? Is it not getting poured out anymore? We have too many churches and too many people across our country today that refuse to surrender their life to God. And God is waiting. He says, bring me yet a vessel. And the answer he gets is, there's not a vessel more. 
and the oil is stayed. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Lord, I pray you bless this time of invitation. Be with us now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor. Before we have music, before we uh, continue the invitation, I can that mic, brother. Some are at the altar praying. You keep praying. If you're at your seat praying, that's fine as well. If you're not, I'd encourage you to grab your Bible, turn to John chapter 8. If you're praying, you're fine. You're absolutely fine. You keep praying. But one thing that has bothered me tremendously growing up in Compton, trying to plant a church out here, one thing that bothers me tremendously is the idea that many of us think we're just too dirty. We're just too marred. We're just too broken. That God can use some, but he can't use me. And I want to read to you John chapter 8. And if you're praying, you're fine. We're going to continue the invitation this way. But John chapter 8, the Bible says this, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him and sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, being at the eldest, or excuse me, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone. Brother Eddie was left alone. Elijah did have a pretty private ministry, didn't he? I had never thought of that, Brother Ed. And, and when you said that and you took the time to explain Elijah and, and some of the amazing, I mean, we're like miracles. And, you know, Elisha did a couple, too. Like, I, I, that was me. But now I'm realizing how intimate Elisha was. And I've been saying that all through the book of John, my whole long ministry of five years or whatever. I, all of my ministry, I'm like, Jesus looked at the multitude, moved with compassion, but he saw a woman at the well. And he did see blind Bart, blind Bartimaeus. And he did see the man by the pool of Bethesda and, and the pool of Siloam. He, he see man after man and woman after woman individually. And here the Bible says there's a group of people in the temple. And now Jesus is sitting, the word of God says, when Jesus had lifted himself up and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she, she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. And then he said a word that Brother Ed brought out in our text this morning. I think it was in verse 3. Jesus said, Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. You may feel like, yeah, God will use this one and God will use that one and and God is even able to use Brother Ed, but not me. You may feel that way. But that is completely not biblical. It's not Holy Spirit led. Pastor Scheidbach has tried to teach our church, try the spirits. So he would say, what spirit is that of? Yeah, God can use this tall, skinny orange one, but he can't use me. What spirit is that of? That's what Brother Scheidbach has taught our church. What spirit is that of? That is not Bible. Yes, she was an adulteress. Yes, she was caught in the very act. Yes, she was a filthy, wicked, rotten sinner. Yes. But God did not come to condemn. He didn't do that. And so you may be marred this morning. You may be a vessel of dishonor this morning. But there's no better way of starting our conference out getting clean. 
and letting God look at you intimately and privately and say, go and sin no more. Woman, you got two boys, go. Get the vessels, borrow not a few. When you get back, shut the door. I don't know why our attendance is the lowest possibly of this year. Possibly of this year. I have no, no idea why. On one of the biggest Sundays of the year for our church. But then I thought, guess what? Every door that leads to outside is closed. God used the man of God. Decision a long time ago. In my words, he said, whenever, wherever, however, with whoever. And he's here pouring into us. And believe it or not, there's not a few vessels in here. There's a good amount of vessels in here. All the way down a little naughty Alden. And Brother Ed loves that boy. And every time I say his name, I think of Pastor Quinn. And I thank God that our, in our eight-year history, Pastor Quinn came to our church. And I, I don't ever want to miss an opportunity of inviting a man of God to pour into us. And I'll never forget him coming in and not worrying about how many people were or weren't there. And he poured into us. Man, I want my life to count for Jesus. But don't sit there and think, and if you're watching online, don't sit there and think, that God can't use you. Yeah, that was my past. You might be right now committing adultery. On God, cheating on God, going a whoring against God right now. You're condemning yourself. That's not Jesus. He is saying, come. Just like John 4. I can give you water, you'll never thirst again. The reason you're all whoring against me is because you're looking for things that don't satisfy. But I satisfy. Literally, my favorite name for God is I am. Amen. What do you need this morning? He am. He am that thing, that source, that person that you need. So the song says, come everyone if you're thirsty. Drink from a well that won't run dry. Come taste the water that's living. Drink and you will be satisfied. If you feel this morning that God can't use you, Brother Ed, in a joking way, because that's his personality, basically said that God is using him and God is using him. And he's not standing up here saying that God can't use you. Church, he can use you. And so I beg you, as symphony comes to the piano, I beg you, no matter what state you're in, get clean. You may be a vessel of dishonor this morning. I'd imagine, I'm going to take a little liberty here, I'd imagine that some of those vessels, ooh, we don't want to put oil in that, clean that first. I'm imagining that that happened. Did it happen? It's not in the text. But I'd imagine Mama said, ooh, before I pour in this one, clean this one. We can't pour the oil in there. And the Holy Spirit is like, I'm willing. I want to pour into you. But you got to get clean. And so we're just going to have a time of invitation. We're good, Brother Reggie. We're going to have a time of invitation. Actually